Since 1934, Iowa's farmers have turned to the Iowa Farm Bureau spokesman as their trusted news source. Now, the spokesman speaks. Listen in and hear from leading experts on topics important to farmers and agriculture. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our March 25th edition of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and today we're offering you a preview of Iowa Farm Bureau's value-packed 2024 Economic Summit. And later in the episode, we'll hear some important farm succession advice from an author and coach who's known as Canada's Farm Whisperer. Let's start with Iowa Farm Bureau economist Dr. Christopher Pudens, who has spearheaded the development of Iowa Farm Bureau's 2024 Economic Summit, which will be June 14th at the FFA Enrichment Center in Ankeny. Spokesman editor Tom Block recently sat down with Christopher to preview the Economic Summit and understand why it's one that Iowa farmers won't want to miss. Christopher, the theme for this year's Economic Summit is pressures and opportunities. Give us some highlights of the topics that will be discussed at the summit coming up this June. Yeah, today we're talking about the Econ Summit. We're really excited about that. This is the first time this event has been held in person since all the way back in 2019, which feels like an eternity ago at this point. So we're really doing our best to piece together a top-notch agenda here. We'll cover a range of topics during the summit, starting in the morning somewhat broadly with Frank Kelly of Fulcrum Macro, hitting on the world economy, geopolitics, things like that. And from there, we'll zoom in, you know, we'll funnel in throughout the day. From world macro, we'll pivot to trade uh, with some staff from the, the Mexican embassy out in D.C. And then from there, we'll turn to the U.S. economy specifically and spend the rest of the day there. Finally, we'll end the day with some very focused content uh, regarding the U.S. meat supply chain and grain markets and how to navigate challenging market conditions with crafting a pre-harvest marketing plan. The focus of the day will progressively shift from broad to narrow, as I've described, but the emphasis the entire day will be what do farmers in Iowa need to do to make decisions here in 2024 in this challenging ag market situation, but then also beyond into the future. Yeah, you mentioned the economic picture for farmers is much different than even just a year ago. Why do you think that gathering information from a wide range of experts like we have coming at the summit is critically important for farmers and others in Iowa agriculture right now? When it comes to the ag economy, it's always important to consider that wide range of perspectives because the ag economy is a very, I'll just use the word wide economy. The, the ag economy is obviously very local, right? Farmers buy seed from the local seed dealer. They sell grain to the local co-op or the local ethanol plant. At the same time, the ag economy is obviously very international and is impacted by global factors. For example, Iowa has a very productive and diverse agricultural economy and is an absolute exporting powerhouse. So prices and production in places like Ukraine and Brazil and economic conditions in places like China and Mexico really, really matter for our farmers here. And they matter literally for their bottom lines because so much of our product is exported. So our goal is to provide as many different angles or perspectives on that ag economy that I described as we possibly can with the emphasis on content that can help farmers unmask and, you know, really put words to the exact pressures that they are likely already feeling here in 2024, but also to identify potential opportunities for making the most of what is shaping up to be this downturn in the ag economy. Yeah, as we've talked about this year specifically, shaping up to be a difficult year, both crop prices and livestock prices. Do you expect those market conditions to continue it into the long term? Or are we talking a short-term perspective or where are we at with that? Unfortunately, net farm income for this year, 2024, is forecasted to be 25% off of what it was in 2023. And even worse is that was 16% off what it was in 2022. So as might be expected, given that forecast, there aren't a lot of bulls out there in the market right now. There are a lot of bears for example, Iowa State publishes average corn cash prices received by Iowa farmers every year. So it's a little bit of a benchmarking of what things have been in the past. The average cash 
price received by corn farmers in 2022 in Iowa was 686 a bushel. In 2023, so last year, it was 601 a bushel. This morning when I looked, the CME and D's corn futures contract was trading in the 470s. So definitely a lot of bears out there right now. Prices are experiencing a lot of downward pressure and not a lot of support on the bottom side. And quite frankly, that's higher than most farmers are actually going to get because that doesn't take basis into account the way those Iowa State calculations do. So what's going on? Well, the market is currently staring at a USDA carryout estimate that's in excess of 2 billion bushels. That is a massive pile of corn that the USDA is forecasting us to have by the time we hit the end of this marketing year at the end of August. So if we have a dry summer, that could relieve that a little bit, but no one hopes for drought, right? And by the time we hit June 14th, the date of our economic summit, we'll have a much clearer picture of whether or not this downturn that USDA is forecasting for this year is a, is a transient blip or whether or not it's the start of, say, a several year period where we have corn prices in the threes and fours. In order to help farmers navigate the conditions, whatever they, they might be, we have Ed Asset coming in from the University of Minnesota. He is the grain marketing economist up there. And he's going to provide us with some insight into how to craft a pre-marketing plan to help navigate those market conditions, whatever they happen to be at the day of the summit on June 14th. Yeah, let's drill down into some of these specific agenda items. The keynote speaker is a good one for the 2024 Economic Summit, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby. What insights will he be able to offer farmers? We're very excited to have Austin Goolsby, president of the Chicago Fed, be our keynote speaker for this event. He's going to sit down for a fireside chat with Iowa Farm Bureau President Brent Johnson and really kind of get into the nitty gritty of what's going on in the U.S. macro economy, what the news is coming out of the Federal Reserve and what we might see going forward uh, as far as interest rates go. Austin is a really dynamic speaker. He is a very engaging presenter. We are really going to learn a lot from him. As one of only 12 sitting Fed presidents, Austin is in the room where it happens, as the saying goes. Like He is in that room where they're hashing out, do we use monetary policy going forward that will cause interest rates to go up or cause interest rates to go down? And it's not every day that a person gets to be in a smallish room where someone like that is speaking to the audience, and then the audience has a chance to text in questions and literally get questions answered by a Fed president. It's no secret that interest rates are high right now. The Chicago Fed data that was just released here for the last quarter of 2023 shows that farm operating notes are averaging in the eights. Quarter four of 2022, farm operating notes were averaging in the fours. So interest rates have nearly doubled in the farm sector here in a relatively short period of time. And so we'll get into subjects regarding how that impacts the farm sector. We'll also get into subjects regarding land values. And I'm sure we'll get into things like how does a strong U.S. dollar uh, impact ag exports. So all told, very excited to have Austin Goolsby. Should be a very educational segment of the program. Yeah, to have someone of his stature come to Iowa and talk to a room full of farmers, as you mentioned, is a, a great opportunity for folks to come experience. There are also a couple of very interesting speaker panels, one of them on ag lending with bankers and farmland realtors from here in the state, and the other, a meat supply chain panel featuring folks from the feedlot, the packer, and the retail sectors. Describe the focus of those discussions a little bit and, and how the information will help farmers and landowners as they work through the current economic challenges and plan for future years. It's no secret that ag land values have increased substantially here in the past several years in the state of Iowa. And as I've already mentioned, ag interest rates have gone up substantially as well in a similar time period. The ag lending and real estate panel is really intended to dive into the intersection of those two things. What is the state of farm working capital? You know, that'll depend on real estate values, obviously, but also how uh, are interest rates impacting farm working capital? Some questions we might dive into are, 
Have capital investments slowed down? You know, what do machinery purchases look like? Things like that. Are we seeing any change in land sales patterns? Is there a difference between those A plus fields and the prices that those are commanding right now and say those BB minus fields and the prices those are commanding right now? So to talk about these things and to really examine these questions, we'll have three panelists. We have Jim Canute of Farm Credit Services of America. We have Kent Stensland of Bank Midwest and Spirit Lake. And then we have Travis Smock of People's Company. And each panelist will bring something a little unique to the discussion since they all represent somewhat different entities. But we expect an informational and even fun discussion on these matters. We're also really excited for that meat supply chain panel that you mentioned, which will bring together representatives from those three sectors you mentioned. The cattle feeding sector, the packing sector, and the retail space. With everything the U.S. hog industry has gone through these past several years, and then with the U.S cattle supply still contracting as we're working through the trough of this cattle cycle there will be no shortage of things to talk about somewhat unfortunately but we're excited that this panel will cover the meat supply chain from end to end we'll cover cattle feeding with don gales of friona industries who our members actually met with when they went to texas for a cattle feeding market study tour back in 22 Then we'll hear from Dr. Carl Schuld, an economist and the head of Ag Econ with JBS, representing the packing industry. Finally, we'll hear from Jason Pride, the VP of Meat and Seafood here from Hy-Vee in Des Moines. I'm especially excited to hear his insights regarding consumer trends because meat supply chains are derived demand. So the value comes from when the consumer buys the product, most of the time at the retail counter. But that value, you know, trickles back up the supply chain. And so it'll be interesting to hear his insights regarding consumer demand and trends and what he's observing and how inflation has impacted purchases at that retail counter. But then also how that impacts, say, the packing sector and what the retailers are asking for uh, packers to provide these days. And then even, you know, further how that impacts the interactions between the packing sector and cattle feeders, such as Friona. So it'll be really interesting to hear how those, say, retail case decisions and trends trickle up the supply chain. But I'm also just excited to hear what each of them forecasts for their respective companies going forward here in 2024 and on into the future. And as you mentioned earlier, we have room for a, a quite a good number of people, but it's also going to be an, an interactive day where people who attend will have a chance to get their questions asked and answered. Yes. Each session will provide an opportunity for folks to either ask questions at a microphone or submit questions via text message. You know, that'll get transmitted to this stage and the moderator of that particular segment will ask the speaker the question. Well, these are great opportunities and we've only scratched the surface in talking about that entire lineup of speakers that you've assembled. Where can people go for more information about the agenda, some of these speakers' biographies, and also to register? There is more information available on the Iowa Farm Bureau website. There you'll find a complete agenda. Like you said, we just scratched the surface here, but a complete agenda with description and speaker bios and whatnot will be available there. There are also details regarding registration with a list of our event sponsors. So registration will be $40 for Iowa Farm Bureau members and $200 for non-members. All registrations do include breakfast and lunch on June 14th. So that's almost worth the price of admission there. And also a complimentary reception on the evening of June 13th. So the fun thing about that reception is that several of the speakers have agreed to come in early and interact with uh, attendees there at the reception. So a great opportunity to get some face-to-face time with folks who will be on the stage the next day. Given the agenda, I personally think that spots will go quickly. And we have reserved a a nice space for the event, but I I do think that spots will go quickly. And so it's important to make sure to sign up early and reserve your spot before potentially it could be gone. Hoping to really provide folks with insights into how they can make decisions here in 2024. You don't want to miss it. Christopher and our Iowa Farm Bureau team have put together an outstanding agenda for the Economic Summit on June 14th, and we expect a lot of demand for this important event. You won't want to miss it, so be sure to register now to save your spot. You can click the link down in the notes for this podcast episode to review the summit agenda and register, or visit iowafarmbureau.com slash economicsummit. 
Next up is Elaine Fraze. Elaine delivered a keynote address and breakout session at Iowa Farm Bureau's Young Farmer Conference in early February. She's known as Canada's Farm Whisperer, and she was at the conference to share her experience helping farm families improve their communication and conflict resolution skills to facilitate successful farm transitions. Spokesman reporter Bob Beyond was at the conference to pick Elaine's brain after her presentation. We're here with Elaine Fraze, who just finished up a fantastic session at the Farm Bureau Young Farmers Conference focusing on finding fairness in farm transition. Before we get started, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, you are dubbed Canada's Farm Whisperer. How did that come about? That came about by an article with Andrew Douglas in 2013, who was writing an article for Farm Credit Canada. And Faith today picked up on it and calls me Canada's Farm Whisperer. I'm a home economist by degree. I came to Boise, Maine, Manitoba in southwestern Manitoba on mile 16 above the U.S. border. So I live in southwestern Manitoba with my husband, Wes, who's been a certified seed grower for over 50 years. Uh, he and I are in our 60s, late 60s, and our son, Ian, is 35 with his wife, Kendra, who was our successors, and our three beautiful grandchildren live with them right next door. And so we farm a 5,000-acre certified grain farm. But I started coaching farm families with certification 20 years ago when I graduated from the Hudson Institute, but I've been working with farm families for over 35 years. So in an overview, what was your overarching message today to an overflow crowd in your session? So we are packed out because this is the heart's cry of every young farmer, is how do we decrease our anxiety over the uncertainty of our future? The gist of my presentation was finding fairness in farm transition. My definition of fairness is helping everyone in the family be successful. F is for financial transparency. What does that mean about attitudes, about money, and what money means to you, and what do you expect about inheritance? I is the intention of each generation, whether it's grandma and grandpa, the parents, or you as young farmers. And then R is what do you do with people who are greedy or entitled and rebels and say no matter what you want to send and transfer wealth in their direction, it's never enough. And it just really saddens my heart to see the stories that young farmers have shared with me here that... They don't know what's in grandma and grandpa's will. They can't trust that it's true. Parents aren't willing to ask. And people are becoming estranged because they're fighting over greed and entitlement over farm ground, which in Iowa now is out of reach for people to buy. But one thing I didn't mention, in Canada with expensive land, you can give a small piece of land to a non-farm heir, but you give it with a condition that there's a 15-year lease agreement of that land to the farming heir with a first right of refusal. So there are ways of making land transfer happen. But the other thing is I'm not a tax specialist, lawyer, or accountant. And I really think people need to look at the importance of paying tax now and transferring land and wealth with a warm hand, not a cold one. You mentioned FAIR, F-A-I-R. What are some of the other challenges most farm families encounter in farm transition I often say that conflict avoidance and procrastination is the tsunami that is killing agriculture. Conflict is not bad, Bob. Unresolved conflict is traumatic and hurtful, but conflict is a process when it's done well and with positive behavior can help you create solutions. So I have a conflict dynamic profile that I was asking all the young farmers to do, to do some internal work about how they can get stronger in communicating, for instance, sharing their emotion, how frustrated they are the emotions of their parents. A lot of people listening to this podcast are going to say, well, Lane, I don't have very much personal wealth. I have no financial liquidity. It's all tied up in the farm. Precisely, that's your problem because you didn't pay attention to building up your personal net wealth. So creating solutions, expressing emotions, reaching out, adapting, and putting yourself in the other person's shoes. So do you know what it feels like to be a young Iowa farmer married with children two off-farm jobs, daycare, and doing the side hustle of the farm at night, they're exhausted. Yeah. Uh -huh. And people who are exhausted can't make good decisions because they're exhausted. And, and so there's just so much work to do, Bob, around bringing everyone to the table to explain their why. 
I told my own personal story where I've always been wealthier than my farming parents. And at my farm transition meeting with my farming parents, I declared I expect nothing from their estate, which is what happened. But unfortunately, my mother died traumatically and suddenly six weeks after that meeting. And then you'll have other farm families where, well, everybody should get something. Well, then maybe there's residue of the estate or maybe what the person wants is a prized possession. And so when we're talking about the transfer of wealth, money does not equal love. Or does it? Right? And for some people, it does. So it's all about the stories you're telling yourself and you can't keep them in your head. You need to get them out so people can unpack them. So you did mention quite a few examples of difficult situations that you've worked with or heard of or or worked with families, something that happened on the farm. Could you maybe relate a story or two? I have such a good story with my in-laws, Bob, and I I would like to tell that story because it's the what if story. And so the accountant asked my in-laws, what if Elaine's husband, your son, got killed, what would you do with the farm? And the first response was, well, we'll take it back. And I had only been married to Wes for 11 years at that point. And I said, well, may I speak? And I said, look, I'm not moving back to my own farm. I want to raise the children here, and I would give them future opportunity to be the next generation on this farm. So if Wes dies, I'm renting out the land and waiting to see what careers our children want to take. And that became totally fine. And that conversation took less than five minutes, but it was facilitated by an objective third party who happened to be a very well-respected accountant who my father-in-law absolutely had total, complete trust in. And so my example of the good news was that one. The bad news came up in the questions when a woman said, Elaine, what do you do when someone refuses to talk and walks away from the table? That's called stonewalling, that's silence, and that's actually a form of abuse. And you cannot create solutions. And I give a lot of young farmers permission to leave a toxic family dynamic, take their farming skills, their smarts, and their energy, and be in a joint venture with a non-related party. And so in Canada, I have young farmers come up to me 15 years later and introduce me to their wives who are smiling and say, tell me what happened. And they said, Elaine, 15 years ago, you told me that probably I should leave and start fresh. And I just want to thank you again that I have the life I've always wanted. Thank you so much. And it doesn't mean the family relationship ends, because I have another example where a Hort kid did that. He was only 15 when I did the family meeting with his family. And then I see him 10 years later, and he's got a business down the road. And I said, tell me what happened. He said, oh, Elaine, it's great. I have a greenhouse just down the road from my dad. My dad still farms with my two brothers, which is fine. But I don't have to be in my dad's dynamic. We still go to Christmas and Thanksgiving. and that, The family relation's good. But it's good because I get to create and, and control my own business. So different is not wrong. It's just different. So it sounds like communication is key. You got to sit down at the kitchen table with grandma and grandpa. No, don't or sit in dad. the kitchen. Oh, sit in the living room. Okay, sit in the living because room. Because if you sit in the kitchen, yeah. you become twelve years old again. Because oh, you're sitting in dad's chair. Oh, you're sitting in mom's chair. Don't okay. don't sit in the kitchen. Sit in a circle without a table between you, which is a mediation conflict skill thing, and post-it notes on the on the wall. So your advice for a a family to get started with the conversation? You just mentioned uh, get in a circle, get in the living room. But be prepared before you get there. So the first starting point is talk to yourself. Have a good talk with yourself. I have a tool that people are welcome to uh, go to farmfamilycoach.com on my contact page and just say, send me that what I want sheet. Now, what that is, is a template of questions to say, ask you different things about what you want in your life, because you need to know what you want for your next chapter. And many farm men are afraid of failure, that if they transfer wealth, the next generation is going to screw it up and lose it. They're also afraid of loss of identity. Who are they if they can't call themselves the main manager anymore? And my husband's been very gracious because he's 67 and he's stepping back without stepping away. And he still makes collaborative decisions with our successor. So the idea is to prepare yourself first, then you meet with your spouse. Because I also mentioned in my talk today that if the spouses do not agree, the vision is different, then you're also stuck because they're like two horses, two Clydesdales, unequally yoked or pulling in opposite directions. And you know where that sled's going? Nowhere, right? 
So once you as a couple have a vision or an alignment of values of what you see for your future, then you can start asking curiosity questions with the next generation. Now, some people say, Elaine, we can never do that by ourselves. Well, you don't have to because we work with families on Zoom and we can hook you into Zoom and you can be in different rooms or different houses even or different states and we can facilitate those conversations. But we won't facilitate a family meeting with you until we've done pre-work of individual coaching of each family unit first because you need to be prepared to ask for what you need and why you need it. So whose responsibility is it to bring forth the question? The it's son- whoever okay. wants to be the driver. So we call that person, Bob, the driver. Dick Whitman calls it the champion. Who is the champion of the family unit that wants to see this through? Who is the person that's going to call the coach, make the appointments, get the coaching? Who is the person who's going to call the accountant? Get the financial data so you actually know what you're talking. Who is the person that's going to make appointments for the financial plan? Who is the person who's going to decide, you know, our lawyer retired and we're just kind of floating around here and we don't even know where our old wills are. Do we have a will? Are they updated? Do you see what I'm doing here? So who is going to be the driver of the process? That's the question. And many times it is the young generation daughter-in-law because she's losing sleep at night. If her husband dies next week, Is she kicked off the farm? She has no idea because she has no idea what the future holds for her because it's never been talked about. And that's not that's not good. How do we be fair in farm transition? You mentioned that a little bit before, but maybe we could expand on that a little bit. So what that means is you ask each one of your children and your spouse, can you tell me what fairness looks like to you? And then you shut up and listen. And I told my mother that I expected nothing from her estate because I've always been wealthier than my parents because we've had a very good farm. We've had lots of loss as well, but we've been able to manage a lot better than my parents did. And so the question becomes, what does fairness look like to you? And then you actually listen for people's expectations. And I have many young farmers, Bob, who said, Elaine, my parents have worked their butt off for 40 years. You know what makes me sad? is they cannot enjoy their wealth. My father is a workaholic. He doesn't want to leave the farm. My mom is going on a cruise with her sisters because she's never going to travel with my dad. And my sadness is is that my parents have no capacity or ability to enjoy the fruit of their labor. So I expect nothing from my parents. I've made my own way and will continue, and any residue I get from their estate will be a bonus. And then I have another person sitting in another part of the audience who said, can I adopt that child, please? Because my child wants everything now. So it's like life, Bob. We all have different needs and expectations, and some wishes and wants is greed and entitlement. So when is the best time to start the conversation? Now. And also, I would like families to celebrate the wins, celebrate the progress. And and Stu McLaren, who has taught me a lot about the membership site that we have now, that's his specialty. He, He always says, it's progress, not perfection. So on the back of my business card that I gave out and that people can just ask me for, it's called the binder tabs. So what you do is you make yourself a life binder. And in this binder, you have different tabs. So there's a tab for your legal work, your wills and estate work. There's a tab for your financial planner stuff, which is your lifestyle plan. There's a tab for what you do on those living room meetings with your post-it notes on the flip chart. There's a tab for what kind of debt you're servicing, which is your banking, loans, and credit. An insurance tab, your accounting tab for the benchmarks. Our accountant meets with us when she does her year-end tax and our personal tax or our corporate tax, she has benchmarking documents that tell us where we're at, that we, we know how we're doing. And then also your communication with your coach or accountability partner and your business plan. And there's the other thing. Some families, some founders, some parents are waiting. Well, I'm waiting for my kids to show initiative. I said, have you talked about this? No. Well, how can they read your mind? Love does not read minds. So today I was encouraging the Iowa young farmers to have a vision share their passion through a letter to their parents and also give them a business plan and also visit their lender of choice to find out from a personal wealth perspective how much equity can they leverage as young farmers to start getting skin in the game. 
So lastly, kind of overarching again, what would you want farm families to take away most from your presentation? You get to decide what's most important to you. And fairness is an intention of the heart. What is your intention for your family so that everyone can be successful and be rich in relationship? If you haven't begun those important farm succession discussions with your loved ones, you should start now. Elaine offered you some great advice to get started, and we've included a link to Elaine's website down in the notes for this podcast episode if you'd like to learn more from her. We've also included a link to Iowa Farm Bureau's own farm succession program called Take Root, and we've provided the contact information for the Farm Bureau staffer who heads up Take Root, Amanda Van Steinweich. Back in 2013, Iowa Farm Bureau created Take Root at the request of our members to help farmers keep their farms in the family for generations to come. More than a decade later, the program has served thousands of families. And we continue to offer our Take Root workshops at various locations across the state throughout the year. To find the upcoming workshop nearest you, you can check out iowafarmbureau.com slash take root. That's all for this episode of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and that you'll join us for the next one on April 8th. Thank you for doing the work that inspires everything we do here at the Iowa Farm Bureau. And thanks for listening to the Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.